morning. Good to have you with us on this Wednesday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, tragedy in Ukraine. Breaking news this morning. More than a dozen people are dead and several others injured after a helicopter crash near Kyiv. Now, Ukrainian officials confirming, confirming that interior ministry leaders are among those killed. What we're learning about the investigation as it begins. Orchestrated this morning, a failed GOP candidate now behind bars in New Mexico, accused in a string of shootings, targeting the homes of local Democratic officials. They were dangerous attacks, not only to these individuals, but fundamentally also to democracy. What we know about the suspect and the timeline of attacks leading up to his arrest. Staying silent this morning, President Biden facing new criticism and calls for transparency over classified documents found at his Delaware home and private office. What the White House is saying about the controversy. And walk it out. Researchers are calling them exercise snacks. What a new study shows about the long-term impacts of a short walk and how it could do much more than just break up your day. Are you team short walk? I team long walk, actually. <laughs> I like to do like, yeah. it's the more than five minutes. I like to do longer, so I'll, I'll, it's a long snack. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long walking snack. I am into long <laughs> snacks, uh, exercising. <laughs> Both and eating. <laughs> All right, we are going to begin this morning, though, with breaking news out of Ukraine. Yeah, authorities say at least 15 people have died after a helicopter carrying senior interior ministry officials crashed near a kindergarten in a Kyiv suburb. Among the dead, police say, is Ukraine's interior minister and three children. Now, there was no immediate explanation for the incident. We're going to go live to Ukraine a little bit later on in this hour for more on the story as it develops. All right, the former Republican New Mexico State House candidate arrested in connection with a series of shootings that targeted four Democratic officials in the state is expected to appear in court for the first time today. Solomon Pena is facing 15 criminal charges, including attempted aggravated battery with a deadly weapon and conspiracy. NBC News now anchored Hallie Jackson has the latest. New details on an escalation of extremism with NBC News learning the alleged ringleader of a plot to shoot at Democratic officials confronted some of them weeks before, tracking them down in person after losing a state election. He was pretty aggressive. Then in December, County Commissioner Adrian Barboa came home to this. Four shots through the front door, two shots through my partner's vehicle. Um, so yeah, it was it was shocking and scary. And you said you were with your granddaughter just hours before. That was the most terrifying. As I kept thinking, this is through our front door, and you could see the direct path where it went out my back door. And I had literally been there playing with my granddaughter just two hours before. At another official's home, one bullet landed in her daughter's bedroom wall, so close to the sleeping 10-year-old that sheetrock dust was blown onto the girl's face, according to newly released arrest documents. The suspect, Solomon Pena, set to be charged with orchestrating a string of attacks. Accused of paying four men to shoot the homes of four state and local Democratic officials over the past month in what authorities described as an orchestrated plot. An attack on elected official is an attack on democracy. Whether or not it's a Republican or a Democrat, it does not matter. No one was hurt, but Pena, a Republican, is a Donald Trump supporter and, like the former president, an election denier. Even though no fraud was found in New Mexico, officials say, Pena was apparently adamant he should have won a race he lost in a landslide, 74 to 26 percent. His campaign has not responded to a request for comment. The attacks coming at a time of growing concern over politically motivated violence. Experts pointing to an uptick over the past five years and threats to members of Congress spiking tenfold since 2016. We're seeing threats, intimidation and actual violence skyrocketing on the right. Dangerous divisions and a community on edge. Our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that report. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos for more on this story. So, Danny, we know Pena is already facing 15 criminal charges. Looking at them, what stands out? Do you think more serious charges could be added down the line? Yeah, firing a weapon from out from inside a vehicle, firing into a dwelling. A uh, number of assault charges are possible. And frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, attempted murder uh, that tacked onto this. If it hasn't been already, this is a, a fluid story. So. 
uh, they're going to they're going to hit them with everything they can. Why they haven't already? Maybe just because they're firming up their investigation. But expect them to throw the proverbial book at this suspect. Uh, to that point, here we know that Pena has a criminal history. He uh, does. We just heard in Halley's reporting, he's an election denier. How much of that do you expect will influence the trial? He was convicted of burglary and related crimes. He served, he was convicted in 2008. He served about seven years. Now, the rules of evidence in New Mexico mirror those of the federal rules. And prior criminal convictions can come in if they satisfy what's called the 403 test. And it means that the prejudice or the probative value, in other words, the relevance of it, uh, must outweigh the prejudicial effects. So just to give a silly example, if someone's convicted of uh, marijuana use, 30 years earlier. That's the kind of conviction that the prejudicial effect would far outweigh the probative value. But in a case where you're dealing with maybe felony burglary, that might come in. So the answer is it really depends on the judge, but it could come in. And that kind of evidence is devastating. Albuquerque police have said they have new evidence linking Pena to at least one of the crimes. Let's take a listen to them. On the last shooting, we now have evidence, too, that Pena himself went on this shooting and actually pulled the trigger on at least one of the firearms that was used. So what's the impact of that sort of evidence? And what other evidence are prosecutors going to be looking for here from police as they try and put this case together? Actually, thanks to conspiracy laws, he doesn't need to pull the trigger on each outing. As long as he entered into some unholy agreement and took any substantial step towards completing that, uh, that's why the getaway driver can be charged with the same crimes as the person who pulled the trigger. And that includes the mastermind who may be back at his apartment just monitoring it uh, on his cell phone. Phone. That's why we have conspiracy law to hold everybody accountable who enters into an illegal agreement. So uh, whether he pulled the trigger or not, it certainly will be relevant to the jury in terms of aggravating the situation. But thanks to those kinds of laws, we can hold everyone responsible who conspires to commit a crime. Such a bizarre story and those alarming details in Holly's report. Danny Smalls, thank you. Thank you. To Washington now and the latest on President Biden's handling of classified materials dating back to his vice presidency. Facing mounting criticism, the White House took questions from reporters yesterday. It's the first time that's happened since we learned last week about those batches of classified documents found in Mr. Biden's former D.C. office and his Delaware home. For the latest on the investigation, let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. Mike, good morning. So walk us through some of the biggest takeaways from yesterday's call with reporters. What is it the administration or what's the strategy, I guess, for the administration going on the record now? Well, Joe, one of the takeaways was that this call happened at all, right? We've been watching those press briefings with Corrine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary, who continues to refer questions to the White House counsel's office. Well, yesterday, more than a week after we learned of these, uh, this disclosure of, and of classified documents, it was the first time the White House counsel's office took questions in a real fulsome way. And 10 questions from reporters, all the answers boil down to three things. You see them on screen there. One, referring a lot of the questions either to the president's personal attorneys, the Justice Department, the FBI, then explaining why they felt they needed to refer those questions. And they talked repeatedly about what they said was a tension between the desire to put more information out into the public sphere, but also not wanting to interfere with the ongoing investigation. And lastly, and I thought this was interesting, they tried to go on offense a little bit here. They really attacked the Republicans who have been uh, attacking the president by saying, one, they really didn't utter a peep as it was put on this call when the former president, Donald Trump, was found to also have uh, classified documents in his, his possession, or they explained it away. And so they really were trying to call out the hypocrisy. One of the questions, of course, Joe, is, is was this a one-off? Are we going to have these calls daily? Or is this a, sim uh, a signal of the new strategy to come? Mike, I want to ask you about, uh, more about point number three there, the White House making a point to call it Republicans, calling it, quote, fake outrage over President Biden's handling of the materials, arguing the GOP's been either silent or outright defended former President Trump for his handling of classified documents. What's GOP leadership saying now about all this? Well, we've really been hearing two different things from Republican leadership in the same vein. The first is that they're pointing to 2019 when Democrats took control of Congress and launched a slew of investigations into President Trump. They are arguing that the kind of oversight Republicans on Capitol Hill are doing now is legitimate and similar to what Democrats did. But we also heard from the speaker yesterday in which he talked about what he continues to argue is a double standard on the part of the Justice Department and law enforcement generally when it comes to one president versus another. Take a listen. 
Are the same amount of agents investigating this that are investigating President Trump? Is the same um, push behind it? It just does not seem fair. This is why the American people get so upset and distrust their government when they see that the law is not applied equally. Now, when we've seen this uh, flurry of letters from Capitol Hill directed at the White House, they launched their oversight investigations. One of the questions is, how is the White House going to respond? Put that question to the White House yesterday, and they said, listen, we're going to read all these requests. We're going to respond in good faith. But they also said they want to see Republicans acting in good faith here, and they don't believe that's happening. Mike, we should note it's not just Republicans. Some of President Biden's Democratic allies have been critical of his handling of this whole controversy. What are they hoping to see going forward as these investigations continue? Well, I think one of the things that we heard in reporting we've been doing over the last few days, our White House team, is one of the, the top recommendations we've heard is that they really need to bring somebody in to help the White House manage this situation. A lot of the officials we've been hearing from in the last few days were really brought into the White House to not deal with uh, an investigation by a special counsel into uh, classified documents, but to deal with more routine oversight matters. And so there's a real suggestion that there needs to be uh, sort of an adult in the room who can come and help with this situation. Uh, but I think the other thing that the uh, Democratic allies are really impressing is they don't want to hear any more drip trip. It seems that even over the weekend we learned of more pages found in the president's garage. And they, they think the White House really needs to answer definitively whether the searches are complete, whether there's anything more to be found. And at this point, the White House is saying they can't answer those questions because it's in the hands of law enforcement. All right, Mike Memoli. Mike, thank you so much. In Washington, a fight is brewing over raising the federal debt ceiling. The national debt now stands at $31.4 trillion, with the U.S. expected to hit its borrowing limit on Thursday. But the Treasury Secretary has announced steps to buy a few more months. For the latest, let's bring in NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin. Julie, good morning to you. Talk to us about those steps being taken so that the U.S. can keep paying its bills. What's the Treasury Department planning to do? Yeah, good morning, Lindsay and Joe. Look, Janet Yellen said that they're going to take, quote, extraordinary measures to keep the government open past this Thursday deadline, which is tomorrow. And some of those steps basically include pausing payments to the retirement accounts of federal employees. Uh, the government, the Treasury Department says that this is something they've used before, in fact, 16 times since about the 1980s. Uh, and it's something they say that these federal employees won't feel because in theory, uh, when the government is able to lift the debt ceiling, when Congress is able to come together uh, and hopefully coalesce around that idea sometime uh, before mid-June uh, per Janet Yellen, the idea is that these federal employees won't feel those extraordinary measures being taken. But what will happen is that this will buy some time for those negotiations to happen, which are currently at a stalemate in Congress. So Congress has raised the debt ceiling dozens of times since 1960, Julie, with Democrats and Republicans looking to find some common ground. What are some of the challenges they can expect to face over the next several months? Yeah, look, this happens every few years. And in fact, even a stalemate like this one has happened before. More similarly, in 2011, when President Obama inherited a new Republican House and they wanted to put future spending caps uh, on, in exchange for raising the debt ceiling. That's exactly the conversation we're having now. And so one of the things that Kevin McCarthy, who is now Speaker, assured, particularly to those deficit hawks in his party who handed him the gavel, is that he would fight for those future spending cuts at the same time that they would vote to lift the debt ceiling. That's something the White House has called an absolute non-starter. But in any case, Kevin McCarthy is calling for those negotiations to begin in earnest now. Take a listen to what he said yesterday. What I'd like to do is I'd like to sit down with all the leaders, especially with the president, and start having discussion. I think it's a sign of arrogance if you would say he wouldn't even discuss it. Who wants to put the nation in some type of threat at the last minute of debt ceiling? Nobody wants to do that. That's why we're asking, let's, let's change our behavior now. Let's sit down. So the White House and Democrats, even the Senate Democratic leader, uh, Chuck Schumer, are saying that nothing but a clean debt ceiling raise is a non-starter. If they want to negotiate 
future spending cuts aside from that, that's possibly an opening there. Uh, but it's really hard to imagine how all sides are going to come together around this because even the threat of the debt ceiling not being raised even a month or two before will send my market spiraling and will potentially cost uh, thousands of jobs. And if that debt ceiling is not raised for the first time in history, by the way, uh, that could be really detrimental, including for the U.S.'s future borrowing capabilities, uh, even raising interest payments and doing the opposite of what these Republicans are trying to accomplish by lower, lowering the deficit. Mm. All right, Julie, before we let you go, I want to ask you about embattled New York Congressman George Santos. He now has committee assignments, all the while facing calls for him to resign for lying about his background. What can you tell us about his new roles? Yeah, George Santos was seated on two committees that was decided behind closed doors by the steering committee. The Republicans who control this process yesterday, they seated him on the science committee and on the small business committee. These are more lower level committees. They don't have any security clearances or anything to that effect. McCarthy, uh, the speaker, said that he would not put Santos on so-called A-level committees. That includes the Intelligence Committee, Judiciary, some of those uh, committees that have more oversight and require security clearances. Now, while Santos is under these investigations, that's not something Republican leadership wanted to give him an opening for. But at the same time, Kevin McCarthy said, look, every single member of my Republican conference receives at least two committee assignments. That's exactly what Santos was seated on. The small business chairman uh, told my colleague Scott Wong that a lot of Main Street businesses happen in New York. And so Santos deserves a place on these committee. All the while, these investigations are happening outside of Congress, and the ethics investigation into him, of course, are happening inside of Congress, which could, which could take quite some time. Julie, thanks so much. Let's return now to our top story this morning. At least 15 people have died after a helicopter carrying senior Interior Ministry officials crashed in Rovery, a suburb of the capital, Kiev. Let's get straight out to NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez, who is at the scene for us. Raf, thanks for joining us. We understand the Interior Minister is among those who died. First of all, walk us through what we actually know about this crash right now. Yeah, Joe, this crash has really shaken both Kyiv and Ukraine's wartime governments, as you said. One of the most senior members of President Zelensky's cabinet killed. I want to just show you guys the scene here. You can see emergency crews are still working behind me. This building is actually a kindergarten. And guys, at 8.20 a.m., just as parents were dropping their kids off at school, that helicopter came crashing down in this direction, dropping debris. It eventually crash landed over there. We know that at least three children were killed, potentially a number of other parents who were on the ground here, as well as those nine people on board the helicopter itself. The state security service of Ukraine has opened an investigation. They say they are not ruling out any possibility at this point from some kind of technical malfunction on board to maybe a pilot error or, guys, the possibility that this was a deliberate act to bring down this helicopter. Oh my goodness, Raf, um, the details get even more horrible. What has the reaction been so far in Ukraine? We have seen a real outpouring both from ordinary people but also from the Ukrainian government who have lost a lot of their senior colleagues here. President Zelensky has been leading the tributes. This has been a real shock. The interior minister had been in post since July 2021, so he has been in his job all the way through the war. He is basically the equivalent of the American Secretary of Homeland Security. He is responsible for the interior security of Ukraine over the course of this war, so pursuing saboteurs, Russian spies, and just generally trying to maintain order in a society that is under so much pressure right now. We are going to hear from President Zelensky at Davos later on today, and I'm sure, guys, we will hear further tributes to his minister. I mean, Raf, yeah, anything else you can tell us about the victims of this crash? You just spelled out for us the role these senior ministry officials play in the war effort. I mean, besides just the loss for their family and their friends, how big of a loss is this for Ukraine's government right now in the midst of this war? Yeah, Joe, one thing that is so striking here, it's not just the interior minister who died here. It is basically 
the entire top leadership team of the Interior Ministry. His deputy was on board that helicopter, along with several of his senior officials. So President Zelensky, as well as dealing with his grief, is going to have to refill the most senior ranks of one of the most important ministries in his government. This is a ministry that deals with the police. It deals with issues like curfews, which we are still under here in Ukraine. They manage the networks of checkpoints all across this country. We were driving to the Chernobyl nuclear plant earlier this morning when we turned around to come back to Kyiv for this helicopter crash. But we passed through checkpoint after checkpoint in both directions. So there is a real scramble now to make sure that even amidst this tragedy, there is no gap in the functioning of the Ukrainian government, especially in such an important role. Raph, we, we know it's too early to know how this helicopter crashed, but, but can you help us understand how this process is going to work in Ukraine? We're quite familiar in America when we have an air tragedy, how it works, but uh, who's going to investigate what's going to be the process moving forward to figure out what happened here? Yeah, so this investigation is going to be led by the State Security Service of Ukraine. They are the domestic security agency. You could kind of compare them to the FBI, but they have an even bigger role than that. As I mentioned, they are saying at this point they are ruling nothing out. It is possible this was some kind of pilot error. I'll tell you guys, you can probably see there was a blanket of fog over Kyiv this morning. One theory is that because of power cuts, potentially some of the warning lights on the tops of tall building designed to steer aircraft out of the way might not have been on. So pilot error is one possibility. It is possible there was just a technical malfunction. We know that much of Ukraine's air force is dated. A lot of these aircraft date back to Soviet times. But the other possibility, in the words of the State Security Service, is that this was some kind of deliberate act. I will tell you, we have no indication that this helicopter was shot down by the Russians. We didn't see any explosion in the sky. There's been no reports of Russian fighter aircraft or anything like that. But when such a senior member of the Ukrainian government is killed along with his lieutenants, it is obviously a question that the state security service will be looking into closely. Guys. Raf Sanchez, thank you. Turning now to your weather, we are still keeping track of that massive storm system that's making its way across the country. All right, let's say hi to meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, guys. Great to see you. And yeah, we're going to be tracking this storm over the next few days. Right now, impacting portions of the central plains into the southern plains. It's a two-sided storm system. So we have a cold side with some snow falling and heavy snow is falling in portions of Nebraska. I-80, tough travel there. Some spots shut down. So that's going to be the story throughout the day. We could see over a foot of snow in North Platte, Nebraska. A sharp gradient, though, as you go further east and south in Nebraska. Into the upper Midwest, tomorrow we're going to see some snow as well. And then you can see on that warm side, the southern side, we have some brighter colors, the yellows, the reds, the oranges. That's where we're seeing some heavy rain, and we'll see heavy rain as we go throughout the day. And once this cold front really gets into that warm air, we're going to see the chance for some severe storms. So for today, rain, snow, wind, the chance for flash flooding, the chance for strong, uh, severe storms, heavy snow and wind throughout the central plains. We're going to see those winds really gusting. They're pretty gusty right now with that snow blowing, and we're going to see that snow getting heavier throughout the day. And then we do have a flood risk. That's because we're going to see some heavy downpours. We're going to see some training storms as well and the chance for severe storms in the Mississippi Valley. Now, we're not expecting a severe weather outbreak like what we saw last week, but still expecting the chance for a few isolated storms. We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But as we go throughout Thursday, we're going to see this lifting off to the north and also the east. So now the mid-Atlantic, the northeast, you are into that rain. And it could be heavy at times, again, seeing those brighter colors, especially orange and red. And then this storm system's going to wrap some cold air back into it. So we're going to see some, store, uh, some some snow showers for portions of the upper Midwest and also the Great Lakes. And then by Friday, it continues to lift further off the coast, but still seeing some scattered snow showers for the Northeast and also Northern New England. So this is a couple, few day event, and we're going to be watching it. We watched it yesterday. We're going to watch it today over the next couple days as well. Winter alert stretching from the West into the Northern Plains, the Central Plains, portions of the upper Midwest and also the Great Lakes. 20 million people impact where you see the pink, that is a winter storm warning. That's where we're expecting the heaviest snow. Winter storm watch is in your blue and winter storm advisory 
is in your white. So lots of people expecting some snow today. Where you see the pinks and purples, that's where we're expecting the heaviest snow. I mentioned North Platte seeing some heavy snow throughout the day, and that will be the case. But notice that gradient. I'll kind of put on the totals here, where you see that sharp cutoff from portions of uh, central Nebraska into southeastern Nebraska, where we're looking at Omaha, four to eight inches. That's still quite a bit. It's going to cause some tricky travel, but it's not 10 to 15 like we're seeing North Platte. Minneapolis, three to six inches. Green Bay, 48 inches. So four to eight. So that's a swath of snow that we're seeing into the upper Midwest. Now on the severe side, the warm side, we're looking at six million people at risk, especially where you see the yellow. So that includes cities like Memphis, Little Rock, into Jackson, Alexandria. But it encompasses portions of the uh, Tennessee Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley, into portions of the Ohio Valley as well, where we could see some strong storms as well. For the severe threat, we're looking at winds gusting up to 60 miles per hour. A few tornadoes are possible, and we're going to watch the chance for some hail. Also, flash flooding is a risk as well, where you see the blue from Evansville to Louisville, uh, Memphis into Shreveport, we could see some heavy rain. Rainfall forecast, it's widespread. You see a lot of green on the map here, so portions of the central plains, southern plains into the mid-Atlantic northeast by tomorrow, we're looking at widespread rain, not a whole lot of rain tomorrow in the northeast, but we could see pockets of heavier rain. Out ahead of the storm system, it's really warm. We're looking at temperatures feeling like spring. We're looking at record-breaking temperatures in some spots. 70s for Dallas, Houston, New Orleans, Tallahassee, 11 degrees above normal for this time of year. And notice that warm air all the way to D.C., 57 degrees today. That is well above normal. This warm air will stay in place tomorrow. Pittsburgh into the mid-50s. Philadelphia, you're going to be warm tomorrow, too. 9 degrees above what is normal for this time of year, 50 degrees. But guess what happens? That cold front swings through, the colder air returns, and we're going to be much cooler, at least closer to normal for this time of year. New York City, we're supposed to be right around 40, 41 degrees, so by Saturday we'll see that. Low 40s still on Sunday, 20s in Minneapolis, 24 on Friday. Same story Saturday and Sunday, and we're looking at temperatures in 30s in Buffalo. So that is what we're looking in terms of that uh, cross-country storm out west, so we're looking at one last storm. Thankfully, it uh, doesn't have a lot of moisture. It's going to be on the lighter side, but still could see some rain for portions of Northern California, Oregon, and also Washington. And looking at really windy conditions, too, in the Southern Plains. Back to you guys. All right, good news for the West Coast, and it's a busy day yeah. for the middle of the country mm -hmm. there. Thanks, Michelle. Right. Coming sure. up, a familiar face calling attention to a climate controversy. Environmental activist Greta Thunberg seen being carried away by cops at a protest in Germany. We'll tell you why that happened and what brought her and other pro protesters there next on Morning News Now. We're back with a look at those intensifying protests in Germany. That's where well-known environmental activist Greta Thunberg was carried away by police Tuesday. She joined hundreds of activists who are trying to stop the demolition of a German village, part of an effort to expand a coal mine. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber has the story. Climate activist Greta Thunberg detained while protesting in a western German village that's set to be demolished to make way for the expansion of a coal mine. The 20-year-old smiling as she was carried out by officers in riot gear. A police spokesperson saying she and others were moved due to their proximity to the edge of a mine, but clarifying this was not an arrest, though saying high-profile people don't get, quote, carte blanche. Those detained have since been released, but Thunberg's detention now bringing even more global attention to the town of Lutzerath, where a standoff between activists and police has played out over several days. Last year, local and regional governments reached a deal with the German energy company RWE. The company would be allowed to destroy Lutzerath and expand a nearby coal mine if they agreed to stop using coal by 2030. The country's Green Party helped strike the deal, claiming it would save other villages. But activists call the deal unacceptable. Carbon is still in the ground. We are still here. Literat is still there. And as long as the carbon is in the ground, this struggle is not over. Despite a court order, they refuse to leave the town. <laughs> Now all eyes are on the police after violent scuffles broke out. Authorities defended their actions, the, uh, like saying those who continue to break through police lines are the ones seeking confrontations. Like One thing noticeably absent from the site in January, snow. Police even getting stuck in the mud at the protest sites. 
temperatures soaring earlier this month in one of the hottest winters for Europe on record, with climate change largely to blame. It's been a big topic in Davos, Switzerland, as the town hosts global leaders at the World Economic Forum this week. But there are protests there, too. Activists physically blocked a runway to criticize attendees' use of private jets. It's really important that we hold this top 1% of the richest people of the world accountable. For Climate change on the agenda at this year's exclusive summit and also increasingly across the globe. Ellison Barber, NBC News. And now to more news from around the world as nurses in the UK prepare to join the picket line again. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us with that in other world news. Molly, good morning. Joe, Lindsay, good morning to you. That's right. We are going to start right here in the UK. We saw major nursing strikes back in December. As you mentioned, they are taking to the picket line once again. Nurses will go on strike as bitter pay dispute with the government continues starting today. Thousands of nurses will start a two day strike and bigger strikes already planned for next month. You guys to include ambulance workers and junior doctors. Thousands of surgeries and appointments will be canceled due to the strikes. Now we'll move to a scary air incident in the sky. A Qantas flight from New Zealand to Sydney, Australia landed safely after a May Day call over the Pacific Ocean on Wednesday. The Boeing 737 experienced an issue with one of its engines, but landed safely in Sydney on a single engine. And finally, get this, it's a pretty cool find. Archaeologists in Norway found a rune stone, which they claim is the world's oldest. They say the inscriptions date back 2,000 years, so those scribbles on sandstone could be some of the earliest writing the world has ever seen. Pretty cool, Joan Lindsay. Yeah, definitely, super cool. And my handwriting hasn't improved. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, it, it's gotten worse. <laughs> yeah. Molly, thank you. Coming up on Morning News Now, back in court, attorneys for the former police officer accused of murdering George Floyd are now fighting for a new trial. We'll explain his appeal ahead of a hearing today. Plus, learning to heal how one school is encouraging Native American students to own their identity after generations of hardship. Welcome back. This morning, attorneys for Derek Chauvin, the former police officer convicted of murdering George Floyd back in 2020, will be back in a Minnesota courtroom. They are trying to get Chauvin back in front of a judge for a new trial. In Chauvin's appeal, his legal team argues that there were several legal and procedural errors that prevented the former Minneapolis police officer from getting a fair trial. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster joins us now with the latest on today's proceedings. So Shaq, good morning here. Tell us more about what Chauvin's attorneys are arguing and what we can expect in court today. Good morning, guys. And yes, there are three big asks coming from the Chauvin uh, legal team when they sit before the panel of judges later today. The three of them. First, they want the trial and they want this case to be reversed. That murder conviction in April of 2021, they want that conviction to be completely reversed. They, if not that, then they want it to be reversed and remand for a new trial in a new venue, specifically not Hennepin County, which is where Minneapolis sits. And if not that, they are asking for a remand and for resentencing. They say that the sentence that Derek Chauvin received, about 21 and a half years in prison, that that was too large. What they're arguing is that there were essentially too many factors that made it impossible for Derek Chauvin to have a fair trial. They say, and this is a quote from one of the briefs, they say pretrial publicity was more extensive than in any trial ever in the state of Minneapolis. They say that coverage glorified Mr. Floyd. It, uh, it condemned and it was it demonized, in the words, Mr. Chauvin. And they also say that it had an impact on the jury, that jurors weren't able to be impartial because of that pretrial publicity. This was a long appeal, so there were plenty of accusations in it. One of them, they also say that the prosecutors uh, engaged in misconduct, that they were being tricky with handing over evidence. They say that one of the jurors were biased. And they also also say that that sentence, again, that Derek Chauvin received um, in 2021 was simply too long. So they're asking the court to reverse all of that, essentially. So, Shaq, this is not surprising. Appeals are expected. How is the state responding to this appeal? Right. Yeah, you got a very forceful response from the state, essentially defending all of the actions that prosecutors took in this trial and even defending some of the actions and decisions that the judge in this trial uh, came up with. In terms of juror misconduct and jurors uh, being biased, they say there's simply no evidence for that. They say that, yes, some jurors expressed some skepticism. They did say that they were familiar with the case, they f were familiar with the situation, but that they each pledged to be impartial as 
as they deliberated and as they considered an ultimate decision here. They say that the crime that Derek Chauvin committed was particularly egregious so that the sentence matched the crime that he committed. So you had a very forceful response from the state, from the prosecutors. When we see both sides appear before a panel of judges today, you can expect those arguments to go on for about 35 minutes. But because of these court filings, we got a good sense of what we can expect them to say before the panel of judges today. Well, Shaq, we know Chauvin is also serving a federal prison sentence for depriving George Floyd of his constitutional rights. Yeah. How would this appeal impact that if any number of those things that you cited would be granted? In short, it would not impact that at all. I mean, Derek Chauvin is actually serving this state sentence in a federal prison. That was part of a plea deal uh, that he came up with or that uh, prosecutors and with the federal government and Derek Chauvin's team agreed to. So you see, he's serving that 22 and a half years. He's guilty of second degree murder, third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. Uh, he's sentenced on the second degree murder charge. But with the plea deal for that federal um, crime that he committed, uh, he's serving that in a federal prison. So bottom line, he will stay in the exact same prison even if he were granted this appeal. Appeal. By the way, most legal observers say that he has, uh, the odds essentially are stacked against him, that he has a, high, a lower chance of getting this appeal. All right, Shaq, thank you so much. Tuesday marked the seventh annual National Day of Racial Healing. The day was launched in 2017 by our sponsor, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, to promote healing and understanding among all people. An MSNBC town hall last night highlighted these issues. The reason we don't want to talk about the truth is if we acknowledge what this country was actually built upon, if we acknowledge that the reason black Americans live in the circumstances we do is not because of our pathology, but because of a country that was erected literally on um, extracting wealth from us, uh, then we have to do something about it. We deny our children truth, and they love yes. truth. They desire they truth. Yeah. So. So we have an obligation to give them truth and give them complexity. And this morning, we're highlighting one school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. They are working tirelessly to heal the next generation of Native American students. NBC News correspondent Zinkley Esimal has a story. Hello, my name is Tanaya Stosi. I am Navajo. My name is Diane Wheelie, and I am Salt Clan with the Towering House people. And my grandfathers are Bitterwater and Apache. My name is Selena Martinez. I am Hispanic, Portuguese, Kickapoo, Navajo, <laughs> Cochiti, and Pyramid Lake Paiute. Students and teachers at the Native American Community Academy in Albuquerque, New Mexico, believe identity is at the core of their school's mission. I tell my students, you have to have a voice. Shout, be loud, dress funny, color your hair, tell them you're Native, be proud. But they say this safe space didn't always exist. This same building, once a Native American boarding school where indigenous children were sent to assimilate. I had a couple of aunts that were going to school here. They weren't allowed to speak their language. They weren't allowed to do a lot of things. Like her relatives, Diane Willey, now a Native literature teacher at the school known as Naka, also grew up in the Native American boarding school system. We weren't allowed to wear regular clothes, like we had to wear dresses, the kinds that the government ordered, and we had to have our hair pulled back. Turn to page 37. But today, Willie says she brings her full self to the classroom, working to equip the next generation of Native American students through education. I think when we read someone who wrote about boarding school life, it gives that writer and these kids an opportunity to connect and heal. With nearly 7,000 students in the school district who identify as Native American, NACA allows indigenous youth to claim their identity and heritage after generations of hardship. When we see our students connect to their language, they immediately understand their identity. And they start to identify concepts and historical significance and cultural significance of things that make them more whole in a way that strengthens who they are. The school gives students like Selena Martinez a chance to connect with their native roots through native history, language lessons, and cultural immersion. My grandfather, he's 
passed and we never really knew the native side of him because no one's been able to teach us. When I came to Naka, it was like a culture shock. I got to wear traditional regalia rather than seeing it. I got to be in the dances and I got to hear the music and it was just amazing. Learning from a mostly indigenous teaching staff makes all the difference too. They're very supportive and they're very encouraging and they just want to see the best out of you. By sharing their native heritage and traditions, this community seeks to heal from their past and look toward a more inclusive and representative future. Healing means that you see your ancestors and the plight they had and try to understand why it's important to remember their struggles because without them, we wouldn't be here. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News. Coming up, what could be the secret to weight loss beyond fasting? Up next on Morning News Now, researchers say there's a more effective way to lose weight. Dr. Torres is here to explain in our weekly checkup after the break. A new study is out showing just how dangerous COVID-19 can be during pregnancy. And doctors are encouraging people to take a different kind of snack break with exercise instead of food. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us now with our weekly checkup. Good to see you, doctor. Good to see you guys. Let's start with that largest global study to date on COVID-19 in pregnancy. Researchers at George Washington University found evidence showing just how dangerous COVID can be during pregnancy. What did they find? So, yeah, this is ending up doing 12 studies looking at 13 thousand pregnancies and they found that when women who are pregnant get COVID-19 they're seven times more likely to die or have severe illness end up in the hospital on top of that babies themselves uh, when the mom had COVID during pregnancy are more than twice as likely to end up in the NICU, the NICU. Uh, so what are the doctor's orders here? It's pretty simple. It's, you know, get vaccinated. That's probably the main thing. And we're finding out that vaccine is very safe in pregnancy. As a matter of fact, there's no evidence of adverse effects for the mom or the baby. On top of that, assess your risk. Are you in a community like here in New York City where it's high levels of COVID? If you are, mask up when you go indoors. Simple. Yeah, good, good uh, doctor's orders there. So let, let's talk about fasting, dieting. I mean, sometimes you hear people say, oh, I, I fast one day a week to keep my calorie intake down. But there's actually a study showing that that might not be as effective as just maybe lowering your calorie count. And this is a study from the American Heart Association, and they found, it was a six-year study, they found that intermittent fasting, or timing fasting, as they call it, which I'm doing myself mm. right now, isn't that effective. Mm. Instead, what they found out are you want smaller meals, and you want to restrict your portions. In other words, you want less calories. It's basically a calories thing. If less calories, you're going to lose weight. And so there's no link between the weight loss before the time of the first and the last meal. That's an intermittent weight loss or intermittent fasting. But like I said, I'm doing myself. Are you still going to do it? Uh, you know, I'm going to have to think about it because it doesn't seem to work as much as you did. And then that meal frequency is important. Small meals and then not having as many of them during the day is obviously portion control. So what are the doctor's orders here? Well, doctor's orders in the morning, you assess what you're doing yourself. You know, make sure that you are doing something that can help you and portion size is the biggest thing behind that. Just limit your portions. Get a smaller plate. Don't that wait can help. until you get, right. you're starving and you just, you know, yeah. your mind is bigger than your stomach. But also no diet can do it all. You need to incorporate exercise in there too, moving. I, I love how you ask if the doctor is following the doctor's <laughs> orders. <laughs> oh, right. That's we a great have question. answers. We have to quickly talk about this one because we teased it earlier, but this new study that found that walks, even just five minutes, can keep you healthier in the long run. Long run we're calling these exercise snacks. Exercise snacks, and that's exactly <laughs> what they are. Every 30 minutes, if you get up and walk for five minutes, just walk. You don't even have to walk that much. Just walk around the office, walk up and down, you know, outside, whatever you want to do. That can really help because that prolonged sitting is hazardous to our health. Those five-minute walks can offset that amount of sitting. What if you, you walk throughout to the day. get your snack? That's, <laughs> if it's a small snack and you're doing small meals throughout the day, yeah, portion go. control is great. So so it's it's so <laughs> so doctor's orders, you know, get up and move. That's the main thing. Just do that and make sure that, it, you know, that you take calls on the go, oh, have idea. meetings on the go, just move. All right. Dr. Torres, great advice as always. All Thanks right. so much. You bet. Now for your financial headlines, a jury is set for Elon Musk's trial over his 2018 Tesla buyout tweets. CNBC Savannah now joins us now. Good morning, Silvana. Good morning, Lindsay Joe. Well, the jury has been seated in the trial to determine whether Tesla CEO Elon Musk cheated investors when he asserted in tweets in 2018 he had lined up financing to take the company private. Opening statements are set for today. The trial is expected to include testimony from Musk to explain his thinking. The tweets fueled a rally in Tesla's stock price before those gains faded about a week later. 
United Airlines reporting strong fourth quarter earnings as consumers continue to shell out for airline tickets despite worries about the broader economy. Airline executives have said travel demand is still outpacing the industry's ability to meet it, which has helped keep flights packed and fares relatively high. There isn't much evidence of a slowdown. United expects revenue this quarter to be 50 percent higher than the same period last year. DoorDash will soon start delivering from Starbucks nationwide. The service will initially be rolled out to Northern California, Texas, Georgia, and Florida before expanding to the rest of the country in March. You can place orders through DoorDash instead of the Starbucks app, and Starbucks says it will use stickers on drinks and delivery-specific cup holders to help avoid spills on the ride to your home or office. Yes, Nobody wants a spill drink. You don't want half a cup of coffee no. that you paid for. All right, <laughs> Silvana, thank you so much. Sure thing. Coming up on Morning News Now, a second round stunner at the Australian Open. Defending champ Rafael Nadal is out after getting injured, making his earliest exit there in years. We're going to have a recap, plus more on Coco Goff's performance overnight. We'll be right back. We're back, and the Golden State Warriors were back at the White House. They were there celebrating last year's NBA title. It was their first trip to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue since 2016 after passing on former President Trump's invitation. During their visit, President Biden praised the team for its support of voting rights and for stances against racism and gun violence. Vice President Kamala Harris, a Golden State native herself, also showed her enthusiasm for the 2022 NBA champs by saying Dub Nation is in the House. Star point guard Steph Curry also took the opportunity to thank the Biden administration for their efforts to bring back WNBA star Brittany Griner, bringing her home. So important there. Cool to see that celebration. Months later, they can yeah. still celebrate. All right, there has been a shock early exit in this year's Australian Open tournament. Yeah, top seed and defending champ Rafael Nadal lost his second round match in straight sets against American Mackenzie McDonald. Nadal, who, is, who has the most Grand Slam titles, suffered an injury after the first set and did not look comfortable for the rest of the match. It's Nadal's earliest exit in the Australian Open since 2016. For more on this and other big headlines out of the Australian Open, we are joined by Hall of Fame tennis coach Rick Macy. Rick, always good to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us. I mean, let's start right there with Rafa. I mean, this is just the latest in a series of injury problems for him. How disappointed do you imagine he is to lose like this? And how concerned are you by his by his injury issues? Well, I'm sure he's disappointed, but in the Grand Slams, it's the best of five sets. And he had a tough match before that. And now you got a few days to recover. So it's not surprising. He hasn't played a lot the last six months. And as you get older, you know, he relies on his legs. But what I love about this story, he didn't retire. He said, I'm the defending champion. I'm going to play it out. I, what a class act. But, yeah, as you get older, the legs start to go, and it's getting a little tougher for Rafa. Oh, yeah. Well, Rick, in the women's game, Coco Goff beat Britain's number one, Emma Raducanu. What do you make of Goff's performance, and do you think she has the potential to go all the way? Absolutely. I know the family well. She's an Olympic sprinter with a racket in her hand and an attitude. She's the best athlete on the tour. And the wild card is she's only 18 years old <laughs> and she's already seven in the world. So she's only going to get better and better. She has the game. The door's wide open. You know, Osaka's not playing this year. Serena, you know, exited stage left. Okay. A few years ago, Barty left. So the door's open. And I think Coco is the leader in the clubhouse. Is she your favorite right now to win it for on the women's side? Or do you think there's others who still might have the edge? Well, I think Iga would be the favorite from Poland. You know, Swiatek, I mean, she's number one in the world. But I think Coco, uh, can, Coco can do it. There's no doubt about it. And I think this is her year. And I feel she's definitely going to win a Grand Slam. Rick, we also saw the return of Serbian superstar Novak Djokovic last week. Last year, of course, we remember the drama playing out. He was deported from the country for not being vaccinated against COVID. Now he's back. He was given a warm reception during his first round victory. First of all, how strong did he look? And were you surprised at all by the crowd's positive reaction? Well, first off, he's always strong mentally. Uh, he has a wrap around his leg, so there's a little bit going on there. Um, he should have played last year, but he didn't. I think he's on a mission. He's definitely the guy to beat. He's definitely the guy to beat. He looked pretty good. Uh, there's other players in there, but he's definitely the guy that everybody's shooting after. 
Obviously, we were seeing some images there of Rafael Nadal. Um, but uh, so, do you think there's any lasting, I don't want to say damage, but any impacts from all of that vaccine controversy? Not really. I think it's in the rearview mirror, you know. And uh, I'm just glad he's able to play. It's great for the sport. You know, he's going to go down, in my opinion, as the greatest male player ever to hold a racket. So I'm glad he's getting this opportunity uh, to play the Grand Slams, because at the end of the day, that's what the champions are really judged by. Mm -hmm. Who are you most excited to see play in the Australian Open? Definitely Coco, you know, just because I know the family. Uh, she lives right down the road. Uh, she's young. She's the next great American. So I hope she can do it. And I think it'd be a great story. All right, Rick Macy, thank you so much for being with us. A lot of exciting tennis to watch coming up. All right. Good to see you guys. All right. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.